Now, as we're coming back to this series, again, keep it simple. Say it simple. simple. Say it simple. simple. Turn that person next to you say, keep it simple. simple. Keep it simple. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let's if God is who he says he is, do you believe God is who he says he is? Yeah. Well, if God is who he says he is, then I am who he says I am. I mean, that becomes, when that revelation begins to break loose on the inside of us, Jesus said the Father is seeking worshippers in spirit and in truth. When, when that becomes worship, when revelation breaks loose that this is the truth, I am who God says I am. It becomes worship in our lives and it becomes as you are. So am I. <laughs> As you are, so am I. Say it's simple. simple. And if God can do what he says he can do, do you believe that this morning? Yeah. Well, if he can do what he says I can do, well, if he can do what he says he can do, then I can do what he says I can do. When that revelation begins to outwork itself in our lives, and it becomes worship, it becomes as you do, so do I. As you do, so I do. As you do, so do I. Say it's simple. That's why we have to keep it simple. And if God can have what he says that he can have, then I can have what he says that I can have. A lot of people struggle with that. Because there are a lot of things in the word of God that he says that we can have. <laughs> I'll tell you there's a lot of things in the word of God that he says that we can have that a lot of his people are doing without. I don't know what that does for you, but that saddens me. <laughs> when that becomes the revelation on the inside of us, and it begins to break loose, and that becomes worship, we come into His presence and we say, As you have, so have I. <laughs> As you have, so have I. Say it's simple. simple. Keep it simple. Jesus told simple stories. But he said within these simple stories he was explaining and bringing out into the open things that had actually been hidden from the creation of the world. Stories that revealed to us how his kingdom works. I mean, it's, a statement like that, that's worthy of meditation. And so today we're looking at a very familiar story. But who knows there's always a danger with familiarity. And the danger with familiarity is that we all think we already know everything there is to know. <laughs> so let's go to Luke chapter 10, verse 25. It says, Just then a religious scholar stood before Jesus in order to test his doctrines. He posed this question, Teacher, what requirement must I fulfill if I want to live forever <laughs> in heaven? So this religious scholar, he wanted to test Jesus' doctrines. He wanted to figure out, is this guy bringing the truth or not? You know, I remember when I first came out of the established church and people would ask me concerning the ministry folks that we were involved with, over and over again I got asked this question, oh yes, but are they a real minister? And what they really wanted to know was, had they studied theology at university? Had they been ordained by the establishment? Because in their book, if they hadn't, then how could they be a real minister? Minister, But my response and my answer to them was always, well, let me put it this way, I would say. I believe that if they came across you or anybody else needing help, then they would do all that they could to assist you or to assist that other person. And then I would say that which in my book and which in Jesus' book qualifies them as a real minister. <laughs> we'll find a bit more of that as we move on this morning. See, in John 7, 17... Jesus says, if you want to test my teachings, over and over again they were coming to test his teachings. He said, if you want to test my teachings and discover where I received them, he said, first of all, be passionate to do God's will. Be passionate to do God's will, and then you will be able to discern if my teachings are from the heart of God or from my own opinions. Very often we think hear and do, but you know from a Jewish perspective, from a Jewish, a Hebrew perspective, they actually put, they think of it this way, do and then hear. They recognize it's as you step out to do the will of God that you're more inclined to hear what he says. Some of us, you know, what, that's our experience. It's, it's as you step out, you're desperate, you're passionate, you want to do the will of God and you step out and it's then. 
In fact, in Isaiah it says, as you, as you begin that walk, then you will hear a voice. As you go to turn to the right or to the left, you will hear a voice, and the voice will say, this is the way, walk in it. Jesus said, first be passionate to do God's will, and then you will be able to discern if my teachings are from the heart of God or from my own opinions. As I've said over and over again, for Jesus, doctrine is a doing word. It's a doing word. Who remembers doing words? <laughs> a verb, it's a doing word, isn't it? <laughs> Verse 26. Jesus replied, what does Moses teach us? What do you read in the law? The religious scholar answered, it states you must love the Lord God with all your heart, all your passion, all your energy, and your every thought. And you must love your neighbor as well as you love yourself. Jesus said, that is correct. Now go and do exactly that and you will live. Now go and do exactly that and you will live. They were noticed how some folks just don't know when to quit and let things go. <laughs> you ever been that person? Mm-hmm. You know, it's time to quit. It's time to just leave it there, but you just want to take it a little bit further. Well, that's what this guy was like. And it says in verse 29, wanting to justify himself, he questioned Jesus further, saying, what do you mean by my neighbor? <laughs> so this guy's looking for a definition of who would qualify as his neighbour. And basically he's hoping that there will be certain types of people excluded from that definition. (laughs) He says he wanted to justify himself, which is probably where he's at already in his heart, which is why he's wanting to justify his attitude. So who is my neighbour then? (laughs) Who knows many times there can be limitations placed on people's willingness to relate to others. These limitations are brought about I used to say the, four, the three P's of the Pharisee are pride, prejudice, and preconceived ideas. The three P's of the Pentecostal, prayer, praise, and proclamation. <laughs> the person that's filled with the, with the Spirit of the Lord, he just wants to pray and praise and proclaim. But that Pharisee, that one who's so self-righteous and full of his own importance, looking down on everybody else, his long religious nose at everybody else, pride, prejudice, Preconceived idea. A lot of people are hindered and limited in their willingness to, to relate to other people by pride, by prejudice, and by preconceived ideas. In verse 30, Jesus replied, Listen and I will tell you. There was once a Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho when bandits robbed him along the way. They beat him severely, stripped him naked, and left him half dead. So, and... In this account, Jesus is very clear that it was a Jewish man who was attacked and robbed. So I'm sure at, at, at that point, the scholar fellow, he's, he's, he's feeling quite smug and he, he's struck in with it. Oh, a Jewish man, oh yeah, <laughs> can handle that. After all, he wouldn't have a problem helping his Jewish neighbor. But Jesus continues in verse 31, he says, Soon a Jewish priest walking down the same road, came upon the wounded man. Seeing him from a distance, the priest crossed to the other side of the road and walked right past him, not turning to help him one bit. Verse 32, later a religious man, a Levite, came walking down the same road and likewise crossed to the other side to pass by the wounded man without stopping to help him. So just as Jesus had been very specific and that the man who was attacked was a Jewish man, he's also very specific in that the priest and obviously the Levite were also both Jewish. But not only were they Jewish, these guys were actually professional ministers. Professional ministers. The problem is their actions didn't correspond with their head knowledge of the, of the requirements of God's law. Remember, this wounded man, he was severely beaten, he was stripped naked, he was half dead. It may not have been obvious that he was also Jewish. (laughs) You know, sometimes professional ministers can think that they're only called to care for a select group of people. My congregation, my parishioners, my church members, my denomination. 
see, both the priest and the Levite, it was quite possible that they were viewed as good and caring ministers within the group that they were a part of. If you'd asked anyone who was a part of their congregation, oh, oh, he's a great guy, oh, yeah, he's so caring, so loving, fantastic preacher. But somehow they felt justified in ignoring this man who's lying on the side of the road, wounded, stripped naked, half dead. So they didn't see him, they saw him, but... Well, maybe the priest, maybe he was on his way to an important business meeting. Maybe he was off to take some religious service of some kind. Perhaps the, the Levite, maybe he had an appointment to keep. Maybe he was already running late. Maybe he had some other ministry obligation to undertake. Maybe he's checking his watch and thinking, oh, and he looked at him, oh, you know. <laughs> maybe they even thought, well, if we had more time, but, you know. <laughs> maybe they looked at the wounded man, maybe they took one look at him and instantly judged him. Maybe they reckoned it was his own fault that he'd gotten into that condition. Maybe they thought he was, he was obviously an undesirable of some sort, unworthy of their attention. Or maybe they just didn't think it was their responsibility. But for whatever reason, they passed by on the other side. And I can imagine as Jesus is giving this account, I can imagine the religious scholar who asked the question beginning to sweat a little bit. <laughs> Maybe squirm a little. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, the temperatures are about to get turned up another notch. <laughs> because in verse 33, Jesus says, Finally, another man, a Samaritan, came upon the bleeding man and was moved with tender compassion for him. Remember, everyone in this story so far has been Jewish. But now Jesus introduces a Samaritan. Now Samaritans were despised by the Jews. Despised isn't probably even a strong enough word. They were viewed as coming from a mongrel race with a polluted religion. They were the victims of pride and prejudice and preconceived ideas as far as the Jews were concerned. They were the targets of that pride and prejudice and preconceived ideas. But somehow... This Samaritan had something that the other two professional Jewish ministers, the two guys who had felt justified in passing by on the other side, this man had something that they lacked. He had tender compassion and mercy that moved him to stop and actually be a real minister to the wounded, bleeding, naked, half-dead Jewish man. Remember, Jesus said there's revelation of truth in these stories that has been hidden since the creation of the world. Say it simple. simple. Keep it simple. You see, God created us to take responsibility to care for the world and the people around us. We were given dominion over everything apart from each other. We weren't given dominion over each other. We were commanded to love and care for and protect and serve one another. Amen. Amen. The one place we've never been given dominion is over one another. Peter wrote that. He said, I'm writing to you elders. I'm an elder too. And I want to tell you guys, you don't lord over the brethren. You live your life as an example to them. Yes, Lord. Of serving one another. Sadly, very shortly after a man had sinned, and after the first man had blown it, the Lord gave counsel to one of his sons, to one of the first two brothers, because he was angry and offended with his brother. Only two brothers, and one's angry and offended with the other. And in Genesis 4, 6-7, God says, Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. The sad thing is, Cain rejected the Lord's counsel. And he killed his brother. And then when God asks him later on where his brother is, he replies with an answer that every one of us this morning could really do with addressing to ourselves. 
Genesis 4, 9, the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? One translation says guardian, and the message it says, am I my brother's babysitter? I tell you what, the Lord's response to Cain is kind of chillingly illuminating. <laughs> because he says this, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. In case we haven't already got this revelation, we need to understand we are our brother's keeper. We are our brother's guardian. And even if necessary, his babysitter. Remember what Jesus said, there's revelation of truth kept hidden since the beginning of the world. Where did this all happen? Right at the very beginning. <laughs> right at the very beginning. When we were born again, we had the supernatural ability and responsibility and authority restored to us. To really care for and to impact the world and the people around us for good. Only for good. Acts 10.38 it says, You know how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good, good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. All the blo broken, bleeding, wounded, half dead people. For God was with him. Every one of us here this morning, all of us are ministers, and we need to be real ministers. Amen. And that's not down to how many degrees you've got. You've got you more degrees than a thermometer and still not be qualified as a real minister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not knocking that stuff. I've got good friends that have, need to turn the page to get all their letters on there. But anyway, <laughs> that's not what qualifies you to be a real minister in Jesus' book. But all of us are ministers. All of us have been given responsibility to minister to all. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be witnesses to me. You will be ministers locally, nationally, cross-culturally and internationally. And you'll do it without pride, prejudice or preconceived ideas. But it won't work for you. Remember when Jesus was recommissioned in Peter? Because Peter is a guy who was going to deliver the first sermon of the soon-to-be-birthed church. And what, is Peter, what, is the, what does Jesus say to Peter? He tells him, if you love me, you will tend, you will care for, and you will feed my sheep and my lambs. Amen. Regardless of where you encounter them, regardless of where they come from, without pride, without prejudice, he was challenged on that. Remember Cornelius' servant comes to the door. He's up there. He's up there praying on top of the house. And he, 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 he has a dream. He has a vision. And he sees this blanket coming down from heaven with all kinds of beasts. Unclean. What the Jewish Lord determined as unclean. The Lord says, eat. He says, I would have never had <laughs> The Lord's dealing with him. He's speaking to him. He says, we've moved on, Peter. <laughs> Well, I have cleansed. Don't you ever call unclean again. Amen. Jesus. But I have cleansed. Don't you call common or unclean. Then, of course, this knock at the door comes. And there's Cornelius servant inviting him to come down to Cornelius the Gentile's house. What can he say? I said, there's, when God's on the move, when God is doing something, there's always a shaking. I mean, later on, Peter starts to slip back into that because of peer pressure. What's yeah. peer pressure? It's fear pressure. Mm -hmm. I tell people all over this island all the time, I say, you, your love for God must exceed your allegiance to man-made traditions and doctrines and establishments and everything else. Mm -hmm. It's only your love for God that will take you out of that. You need to be the only love, whether perfect love casts out all fear, including the fear of man. The fear of man that brings a snare, that holds you captive in something that you know you're not comfortable in. God spoke me said, you're living in the last stronghold of, of religious tradition. A stronghold is, 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 is defined, I think it was Edsel Voso, the Argentinian evangelist, defined it this way. It's a mindset impregnated with hopelessness. It causes the believer to think that there's nothing they can do to change it. 
A mindset. It's just a mindset. Impregnated with hopelessness. What a terrible place to be. That's what a stronghold is. The Lord says you're living in the last stronghold. But there's a way to break out of this. Love for God. Only love for God will take you out of that. Jesus. Your love for God must exceed your allegiance to things that are nothing. They seem so big. They seem so ominous. They seem so threatening. And yet they're nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's an illusion. Nothing but an illusion. Nothing but a devilish illusion to hold you back, to stop you from enjoying and experiencing everything that God has for you. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Say it simple. Keep it simple. Says in the end of 34, Jesus continues his story. He says, the man, the Samaritan, he stooped down towards this Jewish man and he gave him first aid, pouring olive oil on his wounds, disinfecting them with wine and bandaging them to stop the bleeding. We need, we need, we need to remember, folks, this is a Samaritan man ministering to a Jew. Ordinarily, that, that Jewish man would, would have avoided this guy like the plague. But, you know, as I've meditated on this over the last couple of days, I, 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 I realized something. The reality is, most people who are in desperate need of help don't care where you come from. <laughs> don't care what you represent if you're willing to help them. Even if before they needed help or recognized they needed help, they despised or ridiculed or looked down on you. All of a sudden, it doesn't matter where you come from. I tell you, there's folks who wouldn't come near a church. In fact, in fact, they even take delight in mocking believers. But see if you come across them when they're down on their luck. And if you reach out to them to help them, there's very few, of, if any, who will reject your assistance. In fact, very often they'll become open to the gospel for the first time. I said very, open they'll become, very often they'll become open to the gospel for the first time. Who knows Jesus came to help? Well, how did I know that? I'll tell you how I know that because he said that he was leaving. But he, although he was leaving, he was going to send another helper. One who would be like him, just like him. His name is the Holy Spirit. He says he'll not just be with you, he'll be in you. Not just to help us, but to help others through us. You see, real love, God's love, the God kind of love, practical love, unconditional love, that love crosses racial, cultural, socioeconomic lines. And I, I want you to really hear this, and I want you to let it go down deep on the inside of you. Real love, God's love, practical love, unconditional love, crosses these lines as though they don't exist. Because in God's heart and in his kingdom, they really don't exist. This is powerful. You need to hear this. You need to let this go down the inside of you. Sometimes we cross the lines and we think, oh, look at me. <laughs> I'm an I doing a good thing. Oh, you won't find any pride in me. I'm, oh, no prejudice around here, pal. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> look how unprejudiced I am. Maybe you need a wee look in the mirror. I said real love, God's love, unconditional love. <laughs> it crosses these lines as if they don't exist because in the heart of God they don't exist. <laughs> so stop patting yourself in the back. <laughs> as he is. In God's heart these things don't exist. As, as he is, so are we. And worship I turn to him and I say, as you are, so am I. <laughs> as he does, so do we. As you do. As you do. People, people ask me something, how are you doing? I say, I'm doing good. And they look at me and say, what's that mean? <laughs> I'm doing good because everybody Jesus when he was doing good, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> As he has, so have we. As you have, Lord, so have I. Hallelujah. <laughs> Say it simple. Keep it simple. 
Verse 34, lifted him up, he placed him on his own donkey and brought him to an inn. And then he took him from his donkey and carried him to her room for the night. And the next morning he took his own money from his wallet and gave it to the innkeeper with these words, take care of him until I come back from my journey. If it costs more than this, I will repay you when I return. Some do this, man. Now, I don't know if this guy had been close enough to the other ministry guys to see them passing by on the other side. It's a possibility. Busy road. But if he had been, he could have done what many others do and just had a moan about how the church isn't doing enough to help people. And carried on on his way, oblivious to the fact that he himself had the ability to help. Come on, somebody. He didn't fuss about how the church folks weren't doing anything. He didn't even fuss about how the government weren't doing enough to combat violent crime. Determined to write a letter to his MP. Just leave the guy bleeding at the side of the road, but he's already putting the letter together on his head. I think I said this last Sunday night, but we have a nanny state because we have a nanny church. Because the church sets the president, the church sets the standard. We have a nanny church where individuals have given up their personal responsibility and their authority. You see, you know you have a nanny state when people are complaining that the government isn't doing enough. Somebody help me here. Don't stop me when I'm preaching good now. And you know you're in a nanny church when people are complaining that the church is not doing enough. When is the church going to do something about this? When is the government going to do something about this? Hey, you are the one who's been given responsibility and authority and dominion in the earth. You are the one responsible to bring great change and transformation. You know what? As I was reading this through this again, because it's familiar. So you can just, oh, let's just do the parable of the Good Samaritan this week. Glory to God. That should be over in 15 minutes. I love the way Jesus emphasized that, that the Samaritan poured on oil and wine and bandaged the man's injuries. And then this is what I really love. He actually emphasizes that he puts the wounded man on his own donkey. You need, you, need, you need to fasten your seat well here, folks. And when he got to the end, he used his own money. He didn't try to set up a crowdfunding campaign. Well, let's try and help this poor guy. He's down in his luck over here. No, he put him on his own donkey. And he used his own money to pay for the man's accommodation. And then he took personal responsibility by promising to repay any shortfall in expenses from his own money. He didn't place any obligation on the wounded man. He didn't even attempt to attach this man to himself. He didn't demand that this man now needed to become a Samaritan after all he'd done for him. <laughs> Come on then. <laughs> and Jesus... In verse 36 continues, he turns to the, the, the guy who wanted to test his doctrines and he says, now tell me which one of the three men who saw the wounded man proved to be the true neighbor. The religious scholar responded, the one who demonstrated kindness and mercy. Who demonstrated kindness and mercy. Jesus said, you must go and do the same as he. I wonder if this guy wished he'd never asked. <laughs> See, it's simple. it's simple. Keep it simple. So, very quickly, and then we'll move on a little bit for a few minutes. The simple message of this story is that we should understand that we are equipped for personal involvement in, help, in helping whoever, whenever, wherever. We don't get to pick and choose our charity cases. <laughs> And we aren't supposed to only show willing to give limited help to a select few. Are you with me? Absolutely. <laughs> now, something else I've noticed on occasion is how we can sometimes refer to people who are in need of our help, especially those who are in more severe need or have been more broken down by the challenges of life. 
those who find themselves very often relegated to the, the lowest levels of society. And sometimes it, it, it comes across like we just want to get in as fast as we can, dump some aid on them, and then get out as fast as we can before we catch something. Remember, according to Jesus, there's truth contained in this story that has been hidden since the beginning of the world. Thank you, Jesus. You see, there were plans that God had for man that were temporarily placed on hold after the first Adam blew it. But the second Adam came to show us how it is supposed to be done, and he came with an upgraded creation mandate. I woke up with a few things a couple of mornings ago that that could rattle the proverbial cage or possibly require some expansion of the new wineskin just as well we've dealt with that one, eh? <laughs> Remember, I can have what he says I can have. I am who he says I am. I can, have, I can do what he says I can do. I can have what he says I can have. And I can argue and fuss against that. I'll say, oh, I can just worship, respond and worship and say, as you are, so am I. As you do, so do I. As you have, so have I. See, I have what I have been given. And you have what you have been given. And we have been given authority. Jesus said something shocking in John 10, 34. This is after he'd been talking about how he had come, that we might have life, and have and enjoy life in all of its fullness, and a superabundance, more than enough life. In verse 34, because all those people are fussing and cussing, aren't they? Verse 34, Jesus answered, Isn't it written in your scriptures that God said you are God? And then he says something. He says, The scriptures cannot be denied or found to be in error. I woke up the other morning, and that's what came in. That was what was, that's what was in my spirit. You are God's. You are God's. A little G, of course. A wee get. Not you are God, you'll never be God, only one God. But you are God's. I mean, it makes sense. Come on, folks, He created us in His image and in His likeness. If God creates something in His image and in His likeness, then it's got to look a bit like a God. He said, You are God's. Is it not written in your scriptures? You are God's. And I'll go and I'll read it where, he, where he's quoting from, what he's referring to. The scriptures cannot be denied or found to be. In error. Doesn't matter what religion taught you, what the theologian taught you, doesn't matter what somebody who's been robbed all their life of everything that God planned for and told you. The scripture cannot be denied or found to be in error. So it might rattle your cage, it might need a little bit of expansion in your wineskin. He was referring to Psalm 82, verse 6, where it says, I say, the Lord says, You are gods, you are all children of the Most High. The Hebrew word translated gods there is Elohim in fact the, the Greek word in, in, in John 10 is the word theos which of course I'm sure you've guessed it actually means gods and in, in the Hebrew word here in Psalm 82 verse 6 is Elohim which again means gods in Psalm 8 verses 4 to 6 it's, I'm going to speak a little bit more of this maybe this evening but it says compared to all this cosmic glory why would you bother with puny mortal man or be infatuated with Adam's sons? Yet what honour you have given to men created only a little lower than Elohim. <laughs> Crowned like kings and queens with glory and magnificence, you have delegated to them mastery over all that you have made, making everything subservient to their authority, placing earth itself under the feet of your image bearer. He created us in his image and his likeness. It makes sense that he calls us gods. I have what I have been given. You have what you have been given. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18. And you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to get wealth. That he may establish his covenant. Which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. You and I have been given power. To create wealth. Not to complain about why the government's not doing enough. Not to complain about why the church is not doing enough. Jesus is very specific. He put him on his own donkey. And he took out his own money. Are you still with me? 
I tell you, it's worth doing a study, folks, and checking out everything in Scripture that we have been given. Jesus said, how much more will our Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit and good things to those who ask Him? He who did not withhold his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how much... How will he not much more freely give us all things? We are told that we have no because we ask no. Jesus said, as you go, preach, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Freely you have been given, now freely give. Give authority. Don't create celebrity super gods. That's idols, they're called. Yeah. They get in the way of the only true God of gods. The only true king of kings. Big K, little K. Kicking kids there. <laughs> the one and only Lord of Lords. Big L, little L. The Samaritan, he used his own oil, his own wine, his own donkey, his own money, and he had all these things. But he didn't only have all these things, he was willing to give them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? Amen. And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? <laughs> what do we have that we didn't receive? The short answer to that is nothing. Nothing. See, the priest and the Levite, they both had stuff that they were only willing to share with a select few. They were unwilling to stretch their giving outside of their limited circle of supposed responsibility. But we are here to take responsibility for it all. Freely receive, freely get. One King of Kings, one Lord of Lords, one God over all other gods. So there's no Lord in over others, just serving all. Come on, somebody help me here. There's a foundation scripture, I'm nearly done. There's a foundation scripture that God has placed in my heart in regard to the beginning of this church way back in the day. It's always been there, it's always been foundational, it's always been something I've referred back to, it's always been something I've cried out to God to, and asked God to, to make real in, in, in this church. And it's in Isaiah chapter 58. The fast that he has chosen. Remember the new patch of the new wineskin, that was in, these were in response to a question about fasting. In Isaiah 58, prophetically, Isaiah brings the fast that God has chosen. I want you, I want you, I'm going to read this, this whole, just to conclude our time together here this morning, I'm going, to, I'm going to read this whole chapter out of you. And I want you to let this prophetic word through Isaiah speak for itself. Because as I said, it's always been a foundational word. For me since the beginning of this church. And I'm going to read it from the message translation. And as I read it, I want, you, I want you to open up your heart and open up your spirit and say, God, let this word be deposited in me. Let this word come alive in me. I want the fast that he has chosen. I'm glad. I, even if I'm alone on that, well, I'll just run with it anyhow. Starting at verse 1. Shout! A full-throated shout. Hold nothing back. A trumpet blast shout. Tell my people what's wrong with their lives. Face my family with their sins. They're busy, busy, busy at worship. And love studying all about me. To all appearances, they're a nation of right-living people, law-abiding, God-honoring. They ask me, what's the right thing to do? Just like that fellow came to Jesus. And they love having me on their side. But they also complain. Why do we fast and you don't look our way? Why do we humble ourselves and you don't even notice? And the Lord says, well, here's why. The bottom line on your fast days is profit. You drive your employees much too hard. You fast, but at the same time, you bicker and fight. You fast, but you swing a mean fist. The kind of fasting you do won't get your prayers off the ground. Do you think this is the kind of fast day that I'm after? A day to show off humility? To put on a pious long face and parade around solemnly in black. Do you call that fasting a fast day that I, God, would like? This is the kind of fast day I'm after. To break the chains of injustice. To get rid of exploitation in the workplace. To free the oppressed. To cancel debts. What I'm interested in is seeing you do this. 
listen, sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad, being available to your own families. Do this and the lights will turn on and your lives will turn around at once, instantaneously. Your righteousness will pave your way. The God of glory will secure your passage. Oh, Rabbi Shaka. So you turn up down at the ferry terminal and you've left your wallet at home. Don't worry. The Lord of glory will secure your passage. <laughs> you bring testimonies like that. Though. I remember one day I, I walked out of Father's house. I needed to pay a bill. I had no money. The Lord said, like I said, I got to sat in there and prayed. Oh God, oh God, oh God, this bill's due. I've got no money, I've got no money. I walked out of Father's house. He said, just go out. I walked out. I started walking along the street. I'm walking along Cromwell Street just at the Bank of Scotland. I met a brother. He said, well, I've been looking for you. God told me to give you this. Straight into the bank and paid the bill. <laughs> but stayed in there. Oh, 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 oh. No, you've got to get up and do something. I did, I did the only thing I could do. I came out of there and walked. And that was all I needed to do. Take a walk. Stretch my legs. I said, oh God, it's terrible. I've been all these people living in my house. I've been feeding them and I've been doing this and I've been doing that. I spent all my money on fuel trying to get to church, Lord. My biggest bill is always fuel, petrol, this, petrol, that, petrol, this. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. No, I get out there and walk. And he said, I'm pleased with all of these things. But get out there and walk. And the God of glory will secure your passage. Yeah. Then when you pray, God will answer. You'll call out for help and I'll say, here I am. <laughs> if you get rid of unfair practices, quit blaming victims, quit gossiping about other people's sins. If you are generous with the hungry and start giving yourselves to the down and out. Your lives will begin to glow in the darkness. Your shadowed lives will be bathed in sunlight. I will always show you where to go. <laughs> I will give you a full life in the emptiest of places. Firm muscles, strong bones. You'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use, and this is so relevant to us right now because this is the year of rebuilding in case you've forgotten. And as I said, that is some pretty little words I fished out of it. Ether somewhere. No, that God gave me that prophetic word for this year. It's a year of rebuilding. Listen to what he says. You'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build a new, rebuild the foundations from out of your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything, yeah. restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate, wow. make the community livable again. Yes. If you watch your step on the Sabbath and don't use my holy day for personal advantage, if you treat the Sabbath as a day of joy, God's holy day is a celebration. If you honor it by refusing business as usual, making money, running here and there, then you'll be free to enjoy God. Oh, I'll make you ride high and soar above it all. I'll make you feast on the inheritance of your ancestor, Jacob. Yes, it says, God says, so say it simple. Keep it simple. And a person next to you say, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the simplicity. Thank you for the truth. Hidden from the foundation of the world, the beginning of this world that you are revealing, that you have been revealing to your people, Father, that we may walk in it, that we may walk in the truth, and as we walk in the truth, that we may experience the freedom that comes no other way. Thank you for that freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Set free. Not from obligation. Set free, Lord God, to take responsibility and authority. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. To be an instrument of supernatural change and transformation in this community. Locally, regionally, nationally, and in this world internationally. Mm -hmm. For yours is the kingdom. And yours is the power and yours is the glory. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done right here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. <laughs>